Hello. Welcome to Dr. Sun Performance at the German Academy of Music and Theatre. A music Innovation Study Center. This session is not only recorded as other sessions, but broadcasted live. So I say hi to anyone, anyone who's watching us. <laughs> if someone is watching us. <laughs> and it's They're all there. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to perform the first presenter here, Christopher Kraft. So without any further ado, I give the word to you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, as a long time saxophone teacher at Cogarts University of the Performing Arts, the Rotterdam Conservatoire in Holland, I took up the challenge about uh, eight years ago to uh, do a PhD study into my own practice as a performing, composing, and teaching uh, jazz saxophonist. My research question was how to use, how to apply advanced uh, improvisational and compositional techniques uh, I, in um, modern jazz and contemporary jazz in order to help composer performers extend their practices beyond functional harmony and conventional chord scale progressions. Uh, my goal was uh, to, uh, to find solutions to demonstrate options for people wanting to go beyond that traditional approach of jazz, which consists of certain chords playing the right scale um, and wondering what would be the next step to spice up the story. Uh, there is a extensive emphasis still in jazz education. I know that for not almost 40 years as a student and after that as a uh, teacher and researcher. It's a quite conservative world <coughs> with us in Holland and around with a lot of focus on traditional jazz forms, tra traditional jazz language. And um, well, my goal was to create some room there. So jazz saxophone education, but it's also for a lot of other, other instruments, most of them, focused on the tonal system, major and minor, augmented, diminished, functional harmony, two, five, one, fourth step, fifth step, turnarounds, and play the Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian scale, up and down, etc. I would like to broaden the artistic palette. I would uh, demonstrate um, tools um, to cross these borders of functional harmony in jazz terms to find melodic lines outside the chords. So inside was what I just said, the correct stuff on the right chord. Outside the chords, wrong notes, creating chromatism, extra tension, spicing up uh, tension and release. In terms of David Liebman, great saxophone uh, improviser uh, and educator, in order to create a kind of harmonic vagueness. This is uh, the story of my um, research. First of all, I came in touch with uh, musicians who were trying to improvise and compose with Peter Schatz tone clock, a system that is related to 12 tone improvisation, 12 tone music, not to improvisation. Um, and secondary, a lot of students that time and some colleagues, one of them performing tomorrow, Bo van der Weer, uh, were um, importing elements of the musical language of Oliver Messia in their works, both compositions, mostly compositions, but also in their improvisations. Bien et tourné de se trouver ensemble, it's a, a strange <coughs> mix of two composers that don't share that much. Uh, maybe in this 
context except the fact that both hated jazz music. Explicitly in their works they wrote don't play that music, that is not relevant. I know better being a musician, jazz musician for almost 40 years. The study starts, it's an online, I wrote an online dissertation. Uh, the first step that is discussed is a comparative analysis of a few of the main publications by jazz educators such as David Liebman, such as Jerry Bergonzi who published a large series of advanced improvisational models. Um, Walt Weisskopf, um, I forgot one, John O'Gallagher, and by analyzing their works in relation to their writings, um, and by experimenting with their models in my own music, I realized a connection to serial music, to 12-tone music, chromatism, intervallic approaches, tra all kinds of transformations of limited sets or large sets of pitches far away from the gravity of tonality, far away from tonal gravity. Um, today I want um, to demonstrate how um, <coughs> my um, transformations, my adaptations of these models resulted in music. Um, let me start, uh, I will um, first uh, discuss Peter Schat's tone clock and play a composition composed with that. Um, then I will shortly discuss Messian's seven modes of limited transposition. That is the part of his musical techniques I apply to my works. And then we will end with what students are always asking for. How do you apply these techniques to a jazz standard? Isn't it true? Philip Frenzel is one of my uh, master students, and I'm very happy to have him here behind the piano. <laughs> Philip. Um, the Tone Clock uh, was published by Peter Schat, Dutch composer, first time the end of 1984, as an article in the daily newspaper in Holland. He was uh, that time working on his collection of trichords consisting of intervals between 1 and 5 with that I mean in 12 tone language a minor second and 5 is a perfect 4 so everything in between included to create 12 tone rows, rows in combinations of the same chord types uh, uh, chord types I want to, to demonstrate that. Um, a trichord, he calls them triads, but that gives, that causes confusion with the traditional uh, functional harmony um, use of, of triads. A triad is just a collection of three notes at distances between um, a, half, a, a minor second, half note. <laughs> and five, so a, mi a perfect four. The first um, trichord, very simple, one plus one, played four times, each one starting from a different level, gives a chromatic scale. Twelve tones. scale. The second combination is one plus two, minor second and major second. 
Again, 12 tones. Third hour, one plus three. Again, again, that minor second. And a, and a, and a, and a minor third. You see, I make a jump there. You know, it's it's of course impossible to put them all after each other because that sequence will not create a twelve tone, but a six tone or an eight tone. You don't cover all twelve tones. <laughs> One plus three, one plus three. Three plus one, three plus one. Again, twelve tones. Um, and so, uh, and so on, and so on. Of course, um, the aim of using this model is not to create twelve tone rows. It is meant to in the way Schat did himself in his compositions, to combine trichords, to combine trichords with the same structure. Um, for instance, the one I just finished with. Um, <laughs> example 1 plus 5 you see C C sharp F sharp 1 plus 5 D G G sharp 5 plus 1 D sharp E A 1 plus 5 F A sharp B 5 plus 1 again <laughs> There's one thing, as you as you as you notice, uh, there is an what uh, John O'Gallagher calls an overall freeness that is kind of irritating. You know, if you if you construct patterns that are built with triplets all the time, you get this three, six, twelve feeling that is nice to create uh, contra rhythms, etc. It can be it can be nice, but it should also be possible to, of course, to create four bar patterns, and a good example was given uh, in this case by uh, uh, Milton Babbitt, another 12 tone serial composer, uh, in his set of all com comprehensive source sets, that it's four of these sets, he uh, adds uh, an extra um, a note, um, so he, uh, he is able this way to create a 12 tone row, row by uh, combining three four note patterns. <laughs> Babbitt's all compressive uh, source set, one plus five. I created a tune that is called Les Mésanges. <laughs> it's uh, built on an F and D flat pedal form, rubato. Uh, focuses on intervallic playing using mainly the trichord one plus five and the combinations uh, one plus five and five plus one. 
And in the improvisations, we use as many transpositions and permutations as possible. Let me song. The Technique of My Musical Language, 1958. It's a very complex work. He wrote a very complex, large, interesting, deep oeuvre. And for me, I picked out these seven modes of limited transposition. Seven modes 
containing six up to ten pitches, so no 12 tone references, no 12 tone uh, rows. An ability, a possibility to divide the octave in segments of six, four, three, two pitches. And that does a ring certain bells with jazz musicians who are familiar with a uh, with the octave divided in six segments because it creates a whole tone scale <laughs> four segments another symmetric possibility that gives the diminished chord it's four major thirds stacked interesting one uh, Messiaen calls it the augmented scale the augmented mode uh, by dividing the octave in three equal segments I'll come back to that and the la last one is maybe the easiest one dividing the octave in two segments <laughs> So, I think four, five, six, seven are all based on that, are all modes with a clear division of the octave in two. <laughs> particular harmonic color and tend to refer tend to have a tonal gravity but not completely because as Messiaen um, emphasizes this is not about harmony tr uh, traditional harmony this is just about color so treat it like that the chords that can be formed with the modes have to, to be thought and read modally and not following the rules of classical harmony. Rather than in terms of tonic and dominant or serial principles, uh, they refer to colors, harmonic colors. Every mode has its particular color due to that actual impression of a closed door or a closed circuit and also the different combinations of sound, sound which cause its limited number of transpositions. These modes can only be transposed a limited times, not such as the 12 tone uh, models that could be limited 12 times, that could be transposed 12 times. I go back to the, let's not do this, um, to the come on, everyone see that stupid thing. To the, the example uh, divi of dividing the modes in uh, in four equal parts, and I'm uh, interested. I wrote them as uh, as intervals, 
with the terminology of the soft tone music. So you have basically, if you see the, the line under the, the lower system, two plus one. And that is repeated um, a major third up. And again. This is the third mode of limited transposition. There is a million harmonies possible in that. Uh, can you can you can you show a few, the the major ones and the augmented ones? Uh, yeah, for instance, <coughs> since you have all the, for example, if we we got this particular mode, you have a minor and a major uh, major chord in it, and then you can you could, for instance, uh, what I'm busy with also, if you take the, the typical jazz voices like a major seventh chord or something, and then you you can move them through the through a whole scale, then you. There's, there's even this this sound is, is implied. And also this one. Which is minorish. But also. Everything is possible. A variety of harmonic colors. There's more uh, colleagues applying, especially uh, this third row. Um, uh, in their compositions, um, but sometimes we jazz musicians take the freedom to s s even play outside the road we construct. And in this case, step outside uh, the Messian three. I uh, tried to, um, as an experiment, to make an arrangement of this uh, M three. I call it the crow calling because the the riff that's not written here is based on a communication I had when I was writing the tune. Uh, I, my my uh, my room my uh, study room was facing uh, a large uh, sea cedar tree. It unfortunately fell down with a thunderstorm last uh, January. It's it's out now, but there was a couple of uh, crows living there, and they were responding to my riff. Um, well. I took the the third uh, the M3 Messian the third mode, and I played every first and four notes. So I skipped uh, now the, uh, I skipped uh, the next four notes. So by doing that, uh, once again, this is the scale. There was a line. Baseline, that which is repeated constantly, uh, broken by a small riff, and uh, we would like to play for you this composition, a crow calling. <laughs> Thank you. 
said <coughs> it's maybe also a good occasion to uh, to play a, a jazz standard a very uh, well-known jazz standard and to apply the tone clock hours to tri-chord combinations I started this demonstration with and um, some of Messian's uh, modes the third the fourth maybe um, applied on caravan by Juan Tutso, AABA form, uh, an A section, C7 to F minor, a B section with four chords. We try to go to start as much inside as possible and bring it outside to see if it works. <laughs>
listen to my uh, online uh, presentation you would maybe agree that both the uh, tone clock tri-chords combinations uh, and uh, messians an application of messians uh, modes of limited uh, transposition uh, very useful very useful uh, ways to get out and to get in to melody again. Thank you. So we have some time for comments and questions, please. I was curious if, if not what it is useful to go outside and uh, to apply these techniques in your improvisation. Uh, would you look more in depth on uh, methodology of how do you approach particularly, for instance, Messian scales as an improviser in your, let, let's say, daily practice oh yeah. and to, you know, to make it work for you as a pr practitioner? Yeah, uh, with both. Also, with, with the, the tricord combinations, as uh, with uh, Messian, I constructed what I call generative patterns with every single uh, tone clock hour or mode. I made kind of uh, scale uh, pattern variations that would help you to apply them to get familiar with the special color of, in this case, the mode. I think th this is the best way of doing it because it's it refers to the, the, the traditional way uh, you work your way through the through the, the, the major and minor scales mm -hmm. and, and, and all variations that were there. So this is why I mentioned I was probably not so clear about this uh, skip four. But if you if you ha have listened to uh, uh, M three, <laughs> you can do like like when you practice major scales you play. And if you do that with Betty on, you get it's longer and it's mysterious. So I mean, and there you start working. Okay, is it, if it is 
before it has it refers to a kind of chord or part of the color of or part of, of a certain chord uh, a dominant seventh chord uh, you know flat 13 or, so, or something you know you, you call you call them they are all there <coughs> I think this works to to master them I, I really like that because if you skip two you get it's inside you know and then <laughs> etc so it gives a lot of uh, material in the hands just to 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 try to travel to experiment with it and <coughs> of course you know it's, it has to be connected to what you do already it's very uh, we, we're talking about informed intuition you know you have so much done most of us my students let's say mm -hmm. and you of course so much ground is already covered, you know, and, and then you, you're always looking for something, you know, to create more tension. It it can work, or maybe you it inspire people to find some model like Bartok or, or something. Yeah, you know. maybe on <laughs> Thank you very much. Any more short comments? Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, great to hear you speak and play. I was wondering about uh, wh when you use those methods to to find really you you you, you, you find you find uh, more sounds and but when you you transfer them to to music when when you did this uh, crow, uh, crow calling. calling so when you uh, the, the score you show you you didn't follow the um, uh, the chords you played you have. Um, well, uh, maybe he should. Uh, uh, the you only know how you spell how you, how you spell the notes co according to how what you translate them into a chord symbol. Yeah, is because what you do, you have a, a, a method and then transfer it to yeah. music, and then yeah. the music is something else. Yeah. You, you hear something else. Yeah. So when you have the spelling, it's yeah. a bit misleading. Yeah. But um, the only thing, uh, I, I, uh, the only answer I can get is, I as an instruction, I write down. A, b a bass note and uh, refer as much uh, to the to the line. Uh, the line was leading. The bass line yeah. was leading. Uh, so yeah. that that's one thing. So that is there, and there's the melody. Uh, what in between? I leave it to him. You know, he knows he knows the the mode, and he can find his way through. And sometimes it's it's a flat five yeah. uh, augmented, and sometimes. It's I don't think it we ever discussed uh, these terms. And I In this tune, I haven't translated it to, uh, to chord uh, symbols at all. I no, I can see, I, and I, I see why you follow the scale, yeah. but when you played B minor, uh, in, in the start and then the, it was a D flat chord, uh -huh. but it was C sharp, yeah. you know, it's, it's a bit confusing. Yeah, mm. maybe, maybe it's on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Just w I just yeah. wonder what you how you hear the scale. I don't know. I I, I hear it the way I I hear, I hear the scale the way I play it. Okay. There's no there's no there's no uh, in between. I mean I practice like I I just mentioned to uh, to to you. And it happens like it happens. I hear it and I try and I try to play what I hear. <laughs> there's no there's no uh, thinking in between, but. I have these these uh, um, these patterns studied, you know. I, mm. I do I do a little bit more than than I just demonstrated. So a certain sound evokes a certain pattern. Mm. Uh, I have to leave it to that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So thank you once okay. again. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so we can move on to the next presentation.
give us what, half a minute to switch over. Can I just yeah, you just can play it. Great, so um, it's my pleasure to present the second <laughs> presenter, uh, Vlasko and yeah, please, <laughs> welcome. presentation is um, about the project uh, devoted to electric viola. Um, it's an artistic project that I started before my artistic doctorate and uh, that I'm continuing after artistic doctorate in a way um, I would do it uh, in any case without this academic environment, but one thing leading in, into another, since about, let's say 2000, year 2000, uh, to year 2006, I um, came into an idea that I can combine these two worlds, this project that I was doing on the side, uh, with my uh, main course education, and later on pedagogy. Um, it all started um, sometime during uh, elementary school and, and my family is kind of rock oriented and uh, my father uh, came to an idea after seeing some electric string instruments that uh, it might be interesting for me and um, he's an industrial designer, so he conceived um, this idea that we actually might produce some kind of design that can be crafted in Belgrade and, and that of course we use some known technology. So one thing leading into another, this instrument here is a um, fourth version of what we have done uh, together. Also this uh, included help of uh, Luthier, like professional violin maker as well. Um, I started when I was young, first by covering some alternative genres uh, on acoustic instruments. And then when I got this instrument, then I was involved in some rock bands, doing some amateur jazz. When I figured out uh, that there is a theory to learn, I dropped out. It was too difficult for me. So, uh, in a way, I touched different genres, and then in 2006, um, I did my first collaboration with composers in Belgrade, and asked four of them to compose pieces for me playing on this viola. Uh, not this, back then it was a different model. Um, and that's about the short version, how it all started. Um, I came to an idea how to form uh, my doctorate thesis. Um, it involved uh, various kinds of research um, from the hardcore research of the history of electric string instruments uh, through investigating uh, patent da databases and uh, finding out different models, technologies, designs, and so on. 
um, to uh, finding out some possible reasons why electric string instruments are not so much in use with what we call classical music or let's say uh, artistic Western European music. Um, I had um, different, let's say, goals. Uh, one of my goal for the doctorate project uh, was to uh, shed light of on these instruments in general. One was to promote and elaborate and reflect on my own practice. And uh, also I was uh, touching uh, some, for me at least, critical subjects on the different kinds of relationships between musicians, between musicians coming from different genres and between different roles in music starting first from the comparison that uh, electric string instruments like violin and viola uh, is in the same relationship with the conventional classical violin and viola like electric guitar is with a classical guitar. Um, why did guitar players accept electric guitar and electric guitar became one of the most expressive instruments in the 20th century and why string players did not accept electric string instruments uh, also there is a question with composers why composers were not interested more into something that's technologically more uh, let's say contemporary so uh, dealing with these questions of being uh, instrumentally contemporary uh, being between something that's popular and that's artistic or is uh, something against something like is it po popular against like high art music and so on um, I defined future ways for my project and in general uh, general I try to show uh, through my studies and disseminated knowledge uh, what's one of the possible further ways of viola can be. A um, little bit uh, about this instrument. Uh, I couldn't say this is what you could call conventional electric string instrument in terms of what it has been in the history or some periods of its transition. Um, let's say if we compare it to electric guitar, you have a guitar, you have an ab amplifier. Uh, if you say an instrument, you consider both. Bef because if you change one amplifier, you get something completely different. Uh, to that point that certain genres are using special amplifiers, let's say in heavy metal, that cannot work in something like jazz, for example. So, physical instrument as itself, uh, some part of it, it's here. We have viola, we have pickup, preamplifier, so it's a physical instrument, but also it's a software instrument as well, because other parts or parts of my instrument are, are simulated through softwares in the computer. And also it's an instrument that's using various uh, algorithm processes applied to the sound. Um, it all comes to a point when uh, you see that there are thousand possibilities, millions possibilities, and uh, it's const constantly kind of provoking or evoking uh, you to do something about it, to improvise, to make something, and it led also to kind of music making or musicking part of my project where I did s produce some music, some pieces, I. Uh, collaborated with other artists in improvisation and of course I kept uh, working with composers in type of uh, workshops or individual uh, collaborations. Um, I would like to present a few pieces now. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few words before uh, each piece. Um, 
most of pieces are products from these collaborations with composers. The first piece called uh, Suburban Summer Dream uh, was conceived as a solo electric viola piece. Uh, but then as composer was happy with this kind of modest and humble uh, result, I got an idea to produce a radiophonic structure that goes along with it. And in 2009, I presented this work uh, uh, for one uh, international competition called uh, Sonic Postcards from Southeastern Europe. And it went very well. I, I won one of the prizes for uh, this radiophonic miniature, which later on I, I transferred uh, to a piece uh, for electric viola and tape.
Okay, thank you. So, uh, as you could hear, um, the line that composer Morgan uh, did was uh, kind of put in this radiophonic structure. I did recording in one day um, that summer, uh, snoring sounds by my parents secretly recorded in their sleeping room and all other sounds are from my our neighborhood so i live in in one suburb of belgrade and it's around eighty thousand people and it's mostly sleeping house so no economy no no like culture life some sports field and so on but mostly people live there and they work and spend their time somewhere else so that that's what that was it uh, next piece is not in the program uh, next piece um, is not in the program by type error uh, it's something that came uh, out from my interest in baroque music um, since uh, electric viola is one maybe most interesting thing to my uh, own personal development my like solo project but i also perform regularly as a regular classical viola player and i have an ensemble i play in belgrade baroque ensemble and this interest in historically informed performance um, led me to an idea that i can maybe combine these two things so uh, there now you will hear you have philip telemann famous Baroque composer um, in the maybe most interesting and most successful period of, of his life he was invited to spend some time in Paris in France and next to these new quartets that he produced uh, there there is a small set of melodic canons so I used possibility of live sampling to play canons with myself in accordance to the title of my project i'm my own merry-go-round so uh, i will play uh, its sonata form uh, it has three movements um, after first movement there will be a short uh, improvised live electronic part from all the data that was going on in the first movement uh, i will uh, experiment a bit with this uh, granular modulation which is kind of a resynthesis of sound that captures small snippets and then reproduce them in various pitches lengths and so on and then I will continue with second and third movement accordingly And since it's Baroque music, I'll use a Baroque bow. Thank you. 
That was, in a way, canon within a canon. And if Baroque music can be played on romantic instruments, there is no uh, reason not to be played on some contemporary instruments as well. Um, 
next piece by Craig Farr. It's called Žuta Potpornica, uh, which he insisted in stays in Serbian. Uh, it's yellow submarine. He didn't give me much of hints for this piece. Um, he controlled a lot, uh, uh, macrostructure especially. Uh, it's a bit aleatoric, a bit serial music. Um, he's a percussionist, so you can hear, because it's for electric viola and tape, um, lots of um, processed percussion sounds in the tape. And I had, uh, in general, uh, general some uh, inspiration from a film called Yellow, Yellow Submarine. It, Submarine, it's a Beatles film. Uh, it's a cartoon, it's from 1968. And in general, it's kind of hero voyage. Uh, in short, um, in film, there are music makers in Pepperland that produce various sorts of music and the blue meanies come and invade this pepperland by um, enabling these music makers to produce different music so there's some conventional music there is some uh, popular music there's some rock music so there's some conventional or classical music uh, is represented by a certain group and e each group has its own representatives and in a way uh, is dealing with uh, this clash between popular culture and higher artistic culture and, and uh, something that's not cultural at all. So I found some, some inspiration for this piece in, in that movie as well.
case for today is by a composer from Belgrade. Uh, I had performed this uh, string quartet several times and we came to an idea maybe we can make electric viola quartet but since I can play with myself maybe two or three violas at a time uh, we recorded uh, four lines and he composed additional fifth line that in a way is combining these four lines and uh, I prepared for today some newest rendition of this piece so uh, in a way all five violas are alive so one is performed live by me and the others are processed live so all the processes are running live and that's it it's four in this bracket that makes one side and one me playing solo so equals two that's the uh, title of the piece four plus one equals two
That's it. Hey, thank you. We might have until we switch over to have maybe time for one little question or comment if there are any or Thank you again. So I think we can oh. <laughs> I think we can start the last presentation for today and uh, okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So uh, please Fabian Gold, the last presenter. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> the big audience. <laughs> yes, well. So I'm happy to be here and I happy to uh, be in the jazz room today and uh, Experimental room, especially. Uh, I am going to uh, present uh, a paper. Uh, it's a pilot study uh, that I made. Uh, my name is Torben Gulps. I'm a piano player, uh, and I also teach at the Royal Conservatory of uh, Music in Stockholm. And uh, I've been doing that for several years. Uh, but uh, recently, I started also a PhD. So I'm even later than you. <laughs> it's a PhD. But the, the special thing about this PhD is it's a, it's a collaboration with the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. So that's nice because that's a quite different environment. So you have to fight for the artistic research, really, because they are not always into that. Um, so this study, this pilot study, is uh, uh, called Interaction Strategies in Impro Improvised Jazz. And uh, uh, well, I, I already got some start up from, from, from you before, uh, while you try to do some new, try to find some new areas in jazz, especially if you have worked in uh, uh, education for so long. So we have, uh, we need to uh, expand the jazz theories. Uh, this is the, the people I'm working with. <laughs> so actually this is you know, the saxophone player, and this is a trombone player, and this is a trumpet player. So I'm the piano player, and I, I work with uh, different horn players. So I try to define their strategies in this pilot study. And the pilot study is made by advanced students from uh, now from Stockholm. So this is really a nice way of working, I think. Uh, so this is what it can sound. So actually when you listen to this it sounds like a, a, a record or something, but it's not. So I'm going to, to tell you a little bit more what I'm doing because it's, it's an experiment and it's a study. So I'm going to talk mostly about methods today. Uh, of course there's a lot of jazz research and we have seen today also examples of jazz research, uh, but I think we need more 
and we can see on this conference that we need more yes research. Uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, research is about melody and harmony and, and theory. Uh, and uh, you can expand it and you can do a lot of things with it. It's, it's a subject that you can do more. But it has been a lot of uh, uh, work on this. Uh, this word, storytelling, is something I'm interested in because you, you talk about jazz musicians, they tell stories. They have to tell stories. If you don't tell a story then it's not okay. So that's a, it's a term that often used in jazz improvisation, storytelling. Um, if you go further on, uh, the timing for jazz musicians, you talk about timing, but there is not so many so much research done. There is, there is and there is an increasing uh, mass of uh, uh, research. But the, the last one is where I'm focusing right now, the strategies, 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 in jazz improvisation. That's a little bit what you talked uh, before, uh, what's, what's uh, over and under the theory. What do you really hear and why, why do you play like this? So the strategies. And uh, I started this for uh, over a year ago and then I didn't know about those uh, 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 research, um, earlier research, but actually there's a American Danish jazz violin player who's made a, a thesis in 2006 and also this year from uh, Great Britain uh, is uh, Thomas Williams and that's good for me because they have done a lot of things. Um, so this is could be a, a, a jazz musician. Some of the jazz musicians they focus a lot of the personal expression because that's that's important and some focus a lot of the acquired knowledge and I would say it's difficult not to handle both, but you can be on different sides on this track. So, so um, wha what I want to know, I want to, I want to find out the strategies, and the only way to find the strategies is, is to ask. And you can ask, but uh, in this method, I, I try to put it up in the to the face, so they have to answer. So. Uh, the only way to decipher those strategies is to ask the musicians. Okay. So the method is like this. The meth method is I start with it's designing the experiment and then this recording and then I analyze the, the recording. I analyze what they play as much as I can, as fast as possible. And then I put it up into the face and I put it in front of a computer and they have to uh, reflect on what they play. And it's much easier when I listen and I see what's happening at the same time. And afterwards, the next step is to may probably code those strategies into different uh, areas to, to get it more known. You can use it as an educational tool even. Um, so you have to start with the to, to, to build the grand piano <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to tell you almost the same again, but in, in, uh, in different uh, ways. So this is the method, the introduction to the study. So when I introduce the study to the participants, the recording part, that's the main thing. My analysis of what's happening. Uh, the participants' reflection over the analysis. And the analysis is not that I say, I hear this, I hear this. Th it's not like that, because I just put up as much information in front of them as possible. Uh, and then I also have a survey in the end to get answers for more uh, questions around. Uh, okay, so now into the uh, real thing. Uh, I have tried different things because it's actually a duo version. It's interaction, improvisation in duo. And I tried it, this, and then I changed this to have a pre-recorded bass and drums. I didn't want to have that from the beginning, but what happened was that, that the musicians are more comfortable when they hear a right cymbal. So, uh, so d the start is, this is what I call the <laughs> I don't know why, but I like the name Ursel. It's it's uh, it's a 
music theory term. <laughs> it's nothing. It's nothing to do with this. But Ursel, this is a pre-recording of an Ursel, and this is open music. So the Ursel is in explicit schedules based on chords or scales. Based on, so they are not stuck to to chords and scales, but they are based on. So this is the first pre-recording. I did five of those Ursels to to work with, with bass and drums, and I played the piano. Step one. Step two, I don't know if you're familiar to Logic, but it's in this case a, a good recording uh, program for Macintosh. You put in these three recordings and immediately mute the piano because I'm going to play the piano again. Uh, okay, so now we can start the, the, mm, uh, the experiment. So the first thing is the introduction, and I think it's very important and probably everybody who needs to do experiments with people uh, understand that uh, if this is going to work, you have to take care of people. <laughs> so the uh, environment, how you explain and so forth is, is so important because they have to feel comfortable. So the introduction is, uh, is uh, the, yeah, something that you have to work on. So it's more like an uh, ordinary recording. It's a sound check. It's uh, you have to get used to the acoustics, and you have to play together, and you have to have uh, self confidence in this. So it's all about making this. This is an experiment, but it's going to be music. It's going to sound like music, even though. So now we want go, uh, now we. Uh, uh, pass through uh, to the recording and in this case because a lot of research uh, focus on the visual contact what's happening how much signals do you have in between uh, except from the music in this case there is no visual contact so it's just by ear so uh, the, the the recording is 10 minutes uh, so first we, we play different things and I have to talk, them, talk to them and make them understand that this is not a dangerous experiment or something. And then we have 10 minutes recording and we start with free improvisation, about 4 minutes. Uh, and then uh, after 4 minutes the, the bass and drums are rolling in. So then we are into this uh, Ursel. Uh, 6 minutes, one, 1 minute part, it's wrong there. So this is uh, the Ursel in um, in Logic. Uh, start with uh, a part rubato, one central scale. In this case, it's D altered scale. And I don't know how many of you are from jazz, but if you if you're into jazz, you're familiar to the scales, and it's not really difficult to to uh, decipher. They they don't see they don't see the jazz here. Okay, I know. I know, I play almost uh, the altar, but not... Okay. Um, next part, uh, there, there are some more harmonic movements, more chords, more scales, more difficult. Uh, and then you have to listen more. You can't be so, uh, self so convenient with what's happening. And then you have a tempo, something is happening, the, the tempo is coming, and you act a little bit different. And st I started with a also a simple scale for a while, moved to more complex uh, harmonics, uh, the chords. And then we started with this uh, free improvisation, then we end in the free improvisation. First free improvisation with tempo, and then in the end we fall out. So, so the, the whole of the recording has uh, like an arc in this case, you don't have to have an arc, but it's, it's, it's easy to happen like that. You start slowly and go back. So it's a kind of 10 minutes uh, piece, anyway. Uh, okay. So this is what you see in, uh, in uh, Logic. Uh, you have the participant on the top. This is uh, audio file. This is the participant transcription by Logic. So I show you, and um, then I have, in this case, my piano score, and 
In the first recording, I played uh, an ordinary grand piano with audio, but in this case, when I play together with the other participants, I play on a disc clavier. So that's really nice because then you have the MIDI si si signal directly, so I don't have to transcribe my part. That's that's one good thing. <laughs> and uh, then uh, pre-recorded uh, bass and drums in the end. Okay, so this is what I work with. Uh, this is the logic transcribing tool, and it's not designed for transcribing, it's designed for something else. But it works really fine, I would say. And uh, for a start, it's, it's good. So if, if you can see this, you can see. Yep, you have the piano over here. No, didn't like it. I won't do that. <laughs> So, uh, there is the piano part, you can see the, the, uh, to the left, and then you have the audio file in the middle, and then you can see where the notes get, and that's really impressive, I would say, because I've tried different programs, and then I found out, okay, I have this in logic. Mm. So this is, uh, uh, if you, you, you can follow it. <laughs> Okay, so when you go from this window, you can go to the score window, and on the top you have the clarinet uh, transcription, and uh, of course it's not right, but this is definitely sufficient for for discussing things and uh, if you if I got some time I can by ear change you see that the second row I change some notes I change some spellings so it, it's, it could be easier to, to watch <laughs> This actually has worked out fine to have this uh, window moving and you can see where they are and you can rewind forward and listen. Why did I do this? Uh, what happened? Uh, so this is actually the reflection, the, the participant's uh, reflection. Uh, and it, it's a little bit difficult, I would say, to explain how they are going to reflect because some are very eager to reflect. Oh, I did this, I did this. And some are like this. So I don't want to, to, to uh, talk to them too much because uh, I wanted to, to I want to have the information from them. So actually I, have, I started out with an uh, uh, interview instead and that was not really good because I talked too much. So it's better if they can do it themselves. Uh, this survey I'm not going to talk because this is not that interesting, but some results from the survey from those five students, I think they were interesting, so I just go to do this fast. How important do you think the understanding of traditional jazz theory has on jazz improvisation? This is what our students think. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I don't know. The, the ne next question is, rank your knowledge in traditional jazz theory, and I think they are good. I just think it's, it's, it's a nice way of, uh, they, they think it's not necessary, but probably they use it, I would say. Uh, how important do you think is the highly developed relative pitch to be capable to improvise in jazz? So everybody's high on this. And it's especially in this experiment, the, the relative pitch is always, because it's on ear and you have to relate. If you don't have perfect pitch, because if you have perfect pitch, they are, they are not into this study. <laughs> <laughs> because they know everything. So the, the, the relative pitch is the most interesting, um, I would say. Rank your relative pitch and they think they have good, and I would say two. 
what significance mm. do we assume good self-confidence has in jazz improvisation? Um, that's also high. So I did a kind of personality test. I'm not going to show you, but I think that's an interesting to see how you act I in different situations uh, because uh, yeah, improvisation, you, you can't hide too much. You have to push forward. Uh, so, the, 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 the goal should be now, for now, and in, in this pilot study, to group uh, strategies. Uh, so this uh, is really a work in progress for me, but I, I, uh, I built it on this uh, guitar player from uh, Great Britain, Thomas Williams, and he has made those uh, categories for strategies, but mostly for guitar. <laughs> so I have to change them, change them and and discuss them, uh, but so I'm not going into this. B but I would like to end this. Uh, I don't know the time. Okay. So I, I just want to show you some strategies because that's nice from the recordings. What kind of strategies do you see, and what do the participants uh, really um, hear from this themselves? So some are easy to find and some are, for me, very interesting to hear about. This is a typical uh, jazz strategy. If you don't have perfect pitch, you start with a note and then move up or down. <laughs> and this is what you hear. Yeah, the, st the participants, they, have, they, they know nothing about the music. Nothing. So they are playing. So this is how it sounds. The, the, the harmony is changing. So it takes just a millisecond second for them to adjust into the new harmony. Uh, so, so it's uh, really interesting to, to do this experiment and, and to, to see how they handle it, uh, this situation. Uh, chromatic, that's a, 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 a jazz uh, strategy. If you don't know what's happening, you can play a lot of chromatics, but you have to land right. <laughs> you have to know, in the end, you have to come out right. But uh, you can ch 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 uh, travel around in, uh, in chromatic movements. <laughs> Actually, this is a diminished scale, and, and I played diminished scale. I don't know how they... It's so fast. <laughs> Actually, that's nice. Um, okay, pentatonic is also a strategy. Pentatonic phrases are easily transferred. You can play them inside the scale, as in this case. You can play them outside the scale, and you can come back. So pentatonic is a, it's a very uh, forceful pattern. So it's kind of waiting. He's waiting. What's what's going to happen? Is his, is he going to change the harmony? So he stays in this pentatonic, and this is also the same. And and, and this is one scale music. This is F major seven. Even on scale, so this is freedom. <laughs> kind of, you just wait. This is not difficult. And and the thing about this, this is not example from this, but it it could happen uh, later on that they are so uh, familiar with the scale, so they move out, of course, of the scale. And when do they do that? And why do they do that? That's a strategy also. So that's interesting, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Connecting notes, this is for perf, uh, no, no, this is for relative pitch, I would say, and theory, because this is, uh, in this case, we start with a D altered scale and, and the clarinet player plays an e, f e flat, and then it moves to D flat major, and what happened, he says, I noticed that it's nine in the new chord, and this is really fast. So if he, if he noticed what kind of note it is in the chord, then he's so we can listen to this. Yeah. So actually, just by uh, connecting the first note, 
hills into the scale into the sound. So I, for D of the scale, it's a, it's a kind of dom it's a dominant, so it's not so weird to go from D alto to D flat also. So. Uh, <laughs> I like this determined attitude <laughs> because if if it sounds wrong, then you can handle it by telling everybody, no, no, I'm right. So this is also the D altered scale, and if you if you see what he's doing, he's playing the E, the note E, and it's definitely not into the D altered. But it's kind of open played, so it could be. But he 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 refers to the E, so he makes a kind of playing over the D altered scale. He's not inside. I used to to talk to the students, my students, about pools instead of scales. So you're in a swimming pool of. of <laughs> this is D altered swimming pool, but the, this E is outside the pool, and he's doing something. Uh, and then we can listen to the C sharp and how you react for this C, uh, C sharp because it sounds outside. <laughs> Stick to few notes. That's a good strategy. If you if you if you know this note is right, you can stick to it. <laughs> Actually, he didn't hear because if you listen to more of this, he didn't hear. He he heard the first chord, but he he would ha had difficult to hear the A minor uh, A major chord. So uh, when when he loses this E playing, then he is uh, more up. So it was a good strategy for him to stay on this E. Uh, Scale-wise, of course, uh, if you find the scale, you can say this is, uh, yeah. And also, this is a good strategy, shreds. I don't know if you know the term shreds. This is when you play everything you can do very fast. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, maybe phrases you have uh, really made your your own. So wherever you play them, they could sound right. In his play time. Yeah. And uh, this is the end of his. Uh, in this case, this is. Uh, because I want to dig more into the instrument uh, speci specific uh, strategy because if you play saxophone you do something if you play trumpet you do other things and trombone so this is this is an example is this, it, it's like I asked him to do this but I didn't this is trumpet <laughs> Yes. Yeah, my compliments for, for a nice uh, uh, performance and, and uh, or presentation, and um, I, I th I'm, I'm very happy to see that, that you're doing this. I, I mm. This is really what I like people to, yeah. to do, um, although uh, the strategies are not are not uh, not of them so exclusive. No. So if you if you say this is a good strategy, one note repeat it, mm. or stick to a few notes. Then I say, well, the intelligence here, the strategy is the rhythm mm. he is dividing. Yeah, that's so there is course. constantly, uh, mm. constantly, even the the, mm. the categories you showed from the, from our colleague from Eng from Britain, such a, 
I mean, they're not exclusive. No, so no, no. I so this is this is. I mean, this is this is hard. To I really so like I, I really like the, the the problem because yeah. if you play if you have played this, sure. you know we, about we, this. We should not simplify the process. No, no, no. no. But it's 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 a, it's a way to uh, to put light on it anyway. You yeah, can you can do it yeah, and then I you can totally problemize yeah. it and you can discuss it like yeah, that. I but totally the, I think it's that. you need some more research about Absolutely. this to yeah. to lift it and yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. Otherwise, we say oh, we play jazz, we don't talk about this. Yeah. So, so no, I, I of agree, course I know. But I see some things yeah, I would you can love the to problems. discuss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, in, yeah. that, in that in that sense. Yeah, of course. So I mean uh, it's too difficult to 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 say something yeah. about. But we've tried. And, and the, another thing is that you record the the trio, mm -hmm. and there's interaction of your playing with the trio, and then you yeah. you take the recording out and yeah. you play with the soloist. You yeah. know, maybe you remember the interaction with the trio. No, so not the interaction, but uh, if you listen more to uh, uh, what what we did, so especially when it's a robot, it's a little yeah. difficult for me because if you listen to the bass, yeah. I, I told the bass and yeah. they are professional musicians, yeah. they are not supposed to play G, yeah, yeah, yeah. they are playing like this, yeah, yeah. so have I have to <laughs> you have to focus, do it like that. Yeah, but exactly. uh, the interaction, uh, I didn't, there was not that p much problem, okay. and actually it's a little sad, maybe because the, the the students they didn't really care about this being recorded. No, they didn't. Uh, they thought it was uh, nice to play anyway. Yeah. P when I started, I, I tried to start with a duo because yeah. duo you can do everything, interaction. Yeah. In this case, you you lock the interaction. Yeah. But I, I keep the interaction between piano and and, and horns and the other ones. It's just for for the environment. Yeah. I would say. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And it, it works. As to the rubato thing, I understand. Yeah. So if it would be really groove or a, a thing, and then, then it, you yeah. would have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I missed the very beginning, so so maybe you did explain this, but yeah. uh, I, I, I really like the... Um, uh, findings that you're getting mm -hmm. uh, for, for this uh, uh, pilot study, and I was wondering if you had any plans uh, to adapt this method and this, um, yeah, yeah, this method to uh, an ensemble. And if so, would you be looking at cyclical um, harmony or the improvisation or both? In, in the in the first step, this pilot, I, I had to do this because I I, I, w I was a focus of the method sure, and I had to do sure. it. But the main thing is to do it with Swedish jazz musicians, uh, but in the same way like this. Okay. Four players that, that are professional and I want to do this study with them. So okay. this is the main thing. Uh, and then the focus is not on ensemble playing, the focus is on <laughs> you, on the, on, the, on the horn player. Oh, uh, okay. So so yeah. It's not on the ensemble playing. It's on your strategies in this environment. Okay. It's this is what I'm doing, and it's yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I can imagine it could be wider. And yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah idea. We need some more master students. We need time. <laughs> <laughs> and time, yeah, of course. Mm. It's a lot of things to do, but I I try to narrow it down yeah. now, and sure. I really want to focus on the. On the professional musicians, because I, I want to, to I want to get them to talk about the strategies and how they. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks to our presenters, and we finished for today, and see you tomorrow. Okay.